Segment three, Golden Black Live. Jerry Seasting joins us, and Jerry needs no introduction to Purdue fans, but uh, uh, standout uh, point guard uh, guard for the Boilermakers, 1976 to 79, part of the Big Ten Championship team in 79. Of course, also enjoyed a uh, storied NBA career with the Indiana Pacers. And I think, right, you are the last Boilermaker. Well, that technically, I guess Glenn Robinson won an NBA championship too with the San Antonio Spurs, but you were part of the Celtics. And Brian and, uh, Carter. Don't forget Brian. Brian. That's right. See, I, I can't sometimes I can't see the forest for the trees, but that's right. Brian Cardinal, obviously, with the Dallas Mavericks. But Jerry, uh, a sad week, certainly for longtime Purdue basketball folks in the Purdue family, the passing of Lee Rose. And Lee was your coach in your senior year at Purdue in the 1978-79. And you've been in touch with him over the years as well. Really a remarkable basketball life for uh, the coach, just because, not only from his year two, you know, leading two separate teams to the final four, Charlotte, and then of course, Purdue in 1980, but also going on to South Florida and, and having an NBA career as an assistant and, and uh, a number of other different roles. But I don't know how, how easy it is to put into words, but with him, uh, you know, his, his impact on you as a player first, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit more about his NBA stuff. Yeah, I, I was only fortunate to have him for one year. Um, my senior year, uh, Fred Schaus was fired after my junior year was let go. And so he came in. Uh, we'd had a very disappointing year the year before from the standpoint. We had a lot of talent on, on the team. Uh, we had three senior starters that had been there for a long time. And then Joe Barry Carroll was a sophomore and I was a junior. And uh, the Big Ten in those days, uh, you know, it, it was tremendous. I mean, I, I always like to refer to it as uh, the golden years of Big Ten basketball because there were so many pros and, and not just guys that had a cup of coffee in the NBA. I mean, guys that had long careers. And so he, he steps into the, um, the system and, you know, that spring, I still remember, I was, I was, you know, almost disillusioned, I guess is the word, because, you know, we didn't come close to, um, you know, uh, reaching our potential. And it was, it was very frustrating year. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the, the players, the coaches, everybody has to take their share of the blame. Um, but it just didn't work out that year. So, you know, I was even thinking about, you know, even transferring, but I knew my senior year, I, you know, it's going to be hard to go somewhere and just play your senior year. I didn't know anything hardly about coach Rose. He had been at uh, Charlotte. I knew, you know, and took that team in 1977, went to the final four. So that's really all I knew about him. Uh, but the very first meeting that I had with him in the spring, um, you know, I knew he was going to be different. He was going to, he was going to hold guys more accountable. It was going to be a lot more disciplined. And um, and then when we came back in the fall, I mean, I couldn't believe the difference in, in how he conducted practice, how how much uh, preseason conditioning that we did. It was totally 100 percent different than the year before. And he he completely changed the culture uh, in a very short period of time. And you'll remember, Alan, uh, at the Big Ten meeting, preseason meeting in Chicago, we were picked to be ninth in the Big Ten. Yeah. You know, we, we'd had a disappointing year. We got a new coach. Uh, Joe Barry and I were coming back, but we had a lot of question marks. The other guys on the team hadn't played much. We had, uh, you know, Brian Walker and Steve Walker were uh, going to be eligible. And then, you know, we had a, a couple new freshmen and then Arnett Hallman came in, transferred in and was a big part of our team. So. You know, going into the season, we really didn't, there wasn't a lot of expectations outside of uh, our team on what we were going to do. So it, it was uh, amazing just from the spring going into the start of the season, how much changes that he made. You know, the old uh, urban legend among Purdue, longtime Purdue basketball folks is that when he met with Brian Walker and Jerry Seast, he said, I don't like guards under 6'5". Of course, he, he, Keith Edmondson came in as a freshman in that first year. Is that true? And how did you? And, and he fell in love with you guys in a hurry when he watched you guys play. But, but uh, what was that that uh, meeting with the coach like? Or is that more urban legend than reality? No, that that's true. Uh, I, I I remember he, you know, when I met with him, and I'm sure a lot of it was motivation, you know. Yeah. But <laughs> even when I first met him, he in the spring he said, "Now you know we've got a." Uh, 
we've got a guy, Brian Walker. He's a pretty good point guard too. He goes, hey, I don't like to play two small guards. And he goes, I'm recruiting this kid, 6'5". He goes, if you look at my team at, at Charlotte, I had big guards, um, you know, I had big wing players. And, uh, you know, I, I really don't like playing two small guards. I don't know how that's going to work. That's going to be up to you guys to fight it out, you know, like we were fighting for the same position. But then, uh, you know, that that's what is what's great about him. Though I, I think it, some of it was motivation, but I do think he believed it. Yeah. But he had the ability to think outside the box once he saw guys on the court and, you know, envision on how he could, um, you know, use everybody to, to strengthen the team and, and not just you know, put, put guys in boxes and you can't do this. You can't do that. Yeah. He had a, he, he was smart enough also to know the, the strength of his team was number 22 in the middle, but you had a good, you know, you had guys that, you know, with yourself and Brian Walker and Arnett Hallman, Drake Morris that could fill roles. How much of that is a senior? Did that take a lot of convincing with in terms of that? Or did you see that, uh, you had the big guy in the middle and that was where it, where it needed to be run through. How did, how did that work? And what was that dynamic like, as you remember? Well, I remember exactly. There was a meeting in the locker room. Um, you know, he, he was a very good communicator and, and we're in the locker room uh, uh, early in the season. And, and he goes, I want everybody to realize one thing. He goes, we got a seven foot center here that's going to be an all American and he's going to touch the ball every time yeah. on the floor. So it was kind of, you know, nobody's going to come down and take a quick shot. You know, we played a pretty deliberate style. Um, you know, we had a transition offense, which even in today's college game, you don't see a lot of trend guys running into an offense. You know, it's it's right. either they're running and in in filling lanes in a fast break, shoot the ball quick or they walk it up and run a play. But we, we would run into an offense and Joe Barry would, you know, he was the trailer and a lot of times would get down the floor a little bit later, but you know, there were two or three passes and then the ball would go into Joe Barry. So he called it a turnout. Uh, right, offense. turnout, I was gonna bring that yeah, up. Yeah. I don't remember it vividly. Yeah, and we, we practiced, you know, that was a big part of our early season because we, he, he also, he did so many things different, Alan than any coach I've ever been around. And, I, and he, he had a, um, a team of students that would come in. They had a little bit of basketball background and they were just, you know, they played dummy defense. And so we would have three groups of uh, five guys running this offense continually for a long time till everybody had it down perfect. And, um, and another uh, fun fact now that I'm thinking about those guys is they all wore a white shirt with the number 31 on it in blue. And that was because we had lost to Indiana State the year by, before by 31 points down in Terre Haute. So he, that was one thing he wanted to get in our mind because we played him early in the season that year too. And, you know, we weren't quite ready for him early in the season. They beat us. But uh, I do remember Arnett held bird to like six for 18 from the field but larry got to the foul line and still ended up with 20 points but um you know he he had us ready to go each and every night we we knew what, what the game plan was and what we were supposed to do yeah, he was a master at motivation i do remember the shirts i don't know who told him i think the actual point spread was like 28 or 29 i think it might have been one of our ma managers that gave him the wrong score but it was all about motivation for him i mean that was what was always impressive to me is everything had a reason there was a re and, and and i can still remember just how much time you guys spent on just running that turnout five on zero i mean you guys you know you guys didn't necessarily run it with defense you just did it till till it became uh, second nature and and it, it worked from that yeah, standpoint yeah. Well, the other thing, our, practice, our practices, and you might remember this too, every time we went from one drill to the next, the time was put on the clock. And I'd never had a coach do that before, you know, because usually what a coach does when you get into, uh, you know, a certain time frame, now every, every coach has a little card and, and yeah. you know, what he wants to do in practice and organizes it and stuff, but he had a time on it. And when that horn went off, you went to the next thing, no matter what. Whereas most coaches, if you're having trouble with something, they'll just stay and keep working on it. And, and, and I asked him, I remember asking him, I go, coach, why do you, why do you put everything on the clock and you know, every single drill that we do? He said, because I've got so many things I want to get in. 
I don't want to belabor one thing. Even if we're not doing it that well, we'll do it the next day or the next day. He goes, but we got to get through all this stuff every day. And we practice three hours, if you'll remember, almost every day up until probably February. He started cutting it back. But I mean, we, we worked. We were in so much better condition than, you know, the teams have been before that I was there. And he, he said that too. He said, um, a lot of games come down to the last couple of minutes are very close. He goes, a team with the best condition and the most discipline are going to win those games. So he, he was right. Way ahead of his time on, on, on those types of issues, you know, in terms of, you know, Bob Knight brought a more controlled offense maybe to the Big Ten, but this was controlled, but still absolutely maximized the talent and the things that you that each each individual could do and uh, it made it me yeah, it was stressful for us managers because <laughs> if we screwed up that timing oh he, he was he, he was relentless on that but it was and that yeah. and the and i remember the jazz as you guys used to stretch i don't know if you remember that as much as anything but he'd pipe in this music and you guys it was kind of like a like a, a uh, light music as you guys stretch, but that was not a harbinger of what practice was going to be like because you got after it. Once, once the, the music stopped, uh, the low-key music stopped, uh, practice was serious business. Right. And there's a couple other things about practice. Um, number one, he, he had a lot of guys, and, and probably you were part of it, that kept stats. So we would, yep. we would practice, we would scrimmage the last hour of practice. Yep. And even in the preseason, we were we, after all our conditioning, we we would play for an hour, you know, just up and down, up and down. So the last part of practice, the last third of practice, was just scrimmage, yep. and he had everybody keeping stats, and he had a point system. Right. And so he he told us before the year, he goes, whoever has the highest total in these positions, he kind of told us, but he told me, he goes, you're 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 trying to be the the shooting guard this year. I'm going to move you over and you'll handle the ball. You and him will be kind of interchangeable in handling the ball, but I want you're going to have to, you know, change your game a little bit and play a little bit different role. So whoever had the highest, you know, so Steve Walker, I, I do remember this, Steve Walker ended up at this first game or two had the most, right. uh, yeah, he started. And Drake Morris came off the bench, but he also said, he goes, now some guys, just because we have this, he goes, I do have the right to change our lineup uh, because some guys are gonna come in and, and can't play as well when the popcorn's popping and other guys are gonna see, he says, so I may change it. But what that did, it, there was genius behind that too, because what that did, you had to bust your tail every single scrimmage to make sure that you were getting your points and all your stats. You know, he had a certain point for assists, rebounds, and negatives for turnovers or what have you. And so those points all added up and, and he put it in the locker room and you'd come in and look and see where you were at. So um, that, that, was, that was something that I'd never seen before or after. Yeah, Arnett, or, um, and I think it was actually in Arnett, because I remember Steve Walker actually went, as remember Steve telling uh, uh, Arnett, I think at a reunion a couple of years ago, that he went to Lee Rose and said, hey, coach, you know, I think Arnett needs to be starting, even though Steve was ahead of in the point point system. And I know Drake was in that same deal and uh, it's quite got quite emotional 30 years later because uh, Arnett really, really appreciated the fact that the, Steve kind of, in some ways, gave up his spot. But uh, yeah, I do remember Roosevelt Barnes. He would motive, he would politic and come up running up the stairs where we sat in the bleed and try to <laughs> try to lobby for stats. It was a, it was a great. Uh, you, you you were you were too entrenched to do that kind of stuff. Talk about you know you, you guys that year obviously had shared the Big Ten championship. You. One of the funny, not funniest things, one of the more amazing things I remember in Purdue fans, Iraqi Arena has obviously been known for great moments. Maybe the great, one of the greatest shots. You know, we know Jaden Ivey hit a big three this year to beat Ohio State, but I would argue the greatest single shot, maybe in the history of that building, was Arnett Holman's uh, basket to beat Magic Johnson in Michigan State, who would go on to win the national championship. But what happened after that was so amazing. And I don't know what your recollections of going into the locker room, coming back out and taking a victory lap. I don't know what you, what your recollections of that, but that was so vintage Lee Rose, I think, in terms of celebration. Right, right. Well, somebody I think had told him that the, the place was still going crazy yeah. and nobody was leaving. So Encore, yeah. yeah, he came in, he said, uh, you know, that he was, you know, he, he really, 
he really kept his emotions in check most yeah. of the time, but he, he got, you know, he got a little uh, uh, excited that day too. And he said, come on, everybody, we're going to take a victory lap out there. You guys go run around the court one more time or whatever. So it was fantastic. I mean, I still remember the shot that, that uh, Arnett took. It seems to me in my memory, like almost slow motion because it was a turnaround jump shot and he went in and it just seemed like, the, the gun sounded right when it hit the net. The buzzer went off right when it hit the net exactly. And it was just, you know, un unreal. He wasn't supposed to take the shot, but yeah. they had denied everybody else the ball. And, uh, and he made a, a heck of a shot there. I think his only basket of the game, and it used to drive the coach a little bit nuts because Arnett liked to shoot that ball out of the corner. And at times didn't do it well, but Arnett was a terrific defender and terrific rebounder and a – and as good a good a power forward as you would have in in the Big Ten at that time, but right. uh, you know you go back and and then you don't get a chance to play in the NCAA tournament, and and that was a you know you went to share the title with Iowa and Michigan State on the last day of the year. You beat Ohio State, and you find out I think it was West Matthews hits a fifty five foot shot to beat Michigan State. West Matthews played for Wisconsin, so you get a share of the title, but you play in the NIT. Uh, your memories of that, and of course that run all the way to the end, uh, and before losing to Indiana. Right. Well, you know, it, it was just disappointing because if you remember, we really we we should have won it outright. We we were in Hawaii. We win the Rainbow Classic, yeah. and we couldn't go back because right. it was a big blizzard, and we and we had to stay two extra days in Hawaii. Which you know we were kind of all thinking that was great and everything. You know to to be in Hawaii a couple more extra days, but Coach Rose passed a kidney stone while we were yes. out. He yeah. was sick, and he so George Faber ran practice for a couple of days, and you know we were you know, feeling good about ourselves because we just won three games and won this tournament and, and we did practice hard, but it, you know, it's hard to keep your focus when you're in Hawaii and you're not in the yeah. Midwest when you're a Midwest team in the wintertime, it just didn't seem like basketball season. So by the time we got on a plane and got back to, we played our first two games in Columbus and, and Bloomington. So we played Ohio State, which, you know, we, we should have beaten easily. I mean, we, we beat that team nine out of 10 times on, on a normal circumstance. And we were so jet lagged out because what is it? Seven or eight time yeah. zones from Hawaii to Columbus, Ohio. We got up and, you know, I remember it, it just didn't feel like, you know, we were, it seemed like we were playing in the middle of the night. We were also rubber legged and jet lagged out. Then to try to get us, we lose the game in, um, in Columbus. And I, I'm sure you remember this. We get a phone call. We, he didn't say anything after the game, but we get this phone call early in the morning the next day. Um, and this would have been, I think we were playing Thursday and Saturday, Saturdays those yeah. days. Yeah. So we get a phone call early on Friday morning and, you know, it, again, it feels like we, this phone calls at two in the morning when it yeah. was really like eight or nine. And he goes, we're going to the gym. We're going to practice. Well, he, this was his way to try to get us back on the time zone. But we went there, we did some stuff. Then we took a bus all the way to Bloomington. Then we practiced again. Yeah. And we played Indiana at noon the next day. And so we, we had nothing left in the yeah. tank, you know, I mean, those weren't hard practices, but just the whole, yeah. the whole thing in those three day things. I mean, I did a lot of travel in the NBA and I never felt like that again, the rest of my life, as far as playing basketball is with the, those two time zone changes. And then Indiana beats us on their course. So we started the big 10, 0 and two and yeah. ended up 13 and five uh, yeah. and tied Michigan state after starting 0 and two. And that, uh, that, uh, an amazing story. Now, one of the, is one of the, I think the epitome or the, is of what a tactician Lee Rose was. It was a difficult moment for you, but the game against Indiana in the finals, you got a shot that you hit a hundred times in your life, but, and got a great shot to, to win the game. Didn't go in, but the way that you were, I, and maybe I'm oversimplifying that, but the way that play was drawn up and the way it was executed uh, was just a sign of what a what a tactician this guy was. What a guy ability to to to, to do things in the moment and be able to get to get to you guys in the right position. 
what's your memories of that as well? And then he also, I think he had some very special words for you because that was a difficult moment for you because you, you didn't get the chance to make the shot. So how do you, how do you, what do you recall that? As yeah, well? that's, if I could change one thing, it would have been, it would have been that play, but what, yeah. what happened? Butch Carter, they had Mike Woodson on one side, on yeah. one, wing. we were in a zone and they had uh, Randy Whitman on the other side and Butch Carter had the ball at the top. Indiana really didn't have a true point guard that year. Uh, Isaiah came the next year. Right. So um, we, were, we were basically giving Butch the shot because he didn't want to take it. And so he had picked up his dribble. I think Brian and I both kind of flared out a little bit towards the wings and Butch, Butch made the shot to give, give them the lead. So Coach Rose called timeout right then. And so, you know, you can't advance the ball in college, but we, we had another timeout left. Yeah. So we threw the ball towards half court, maybe a little bit past half court and took another quick timeout because there was only like three, yeah. maybe four seconds left. Right. So then that's when he drew up the play where I went underneath the basket and ran out towards the corner and I was open, but Randy Whitman was guarding me and he's yeah. about six six, And I couldn't tell because I was running away from the basket how far he was. And I just remember I hurried this shot just a little bit because I thought as soon as I caught it, I had to really get it off or he was going to be right behind me. And when I went up, I was really a little bit more open than I, than I yeah. thought I would want to be. And it didn't go in. Yeah. But he did uh, an example of, uh, like you said, that planning and being able to get, get the right stuff. Sometimes in basketball, it doesn't work out. All right. Talk about, you know, obviously your long career in the NBA and, and in your involvement in the NBA, but, Lee's, Lee's reputation, not only as an assistant coach for a number of years, but also his involvement with the league for over the years. Tell a little bit about that, because a lot of people really don't know about his. He obviously he left Purdue, went to South Florida, coached, I believe, for six or seven years there and, and is still, I think, the all time winningest percentage coach coach in South South Florida history. But talk about uh, his role in the NBA and what you what uh, how much you guys cross paths over the years with respect to that. Right. Well, I'd like to say first is um, it's, it's a shame that he left. I mean, it yeah. really was. I mean, I really had um, a real bad feeling when he left. I, I just thought Purdue made a big mistake. He didn't see eye to eye with uh, some people in the administration right. and the school. And there was, you know, I'm, I don't know all the details because I was just a player, but I know he wanted a bit more recruiting budget. He wanted some things and the school didn't want to do that. And I think he was approached by George Steinbrenner, right. um, who was a big backer at Florida, South Florida. And so he, he got offered more money than what Purdue was willing to pay. I mean, I don't think that would happen today with Purdue's yeah. administration and their athletic department. He, they wouldn't let a guy that just won the Big Ten championship and went to the Final Four. They would have given him what he wanted. But that wasn't the case. And, you know, I, I you know, was not in school, but I was really upset. Yeah. Uh, when that whole thing went down, but then he went to uh, he went to South Florida, and like you said, he was successful there. Um, and then, I, you know, I I didn't keep in real close contact with him at times. I did go down and spoke at his camp and kept in contact with him some. But uh, eventually, when South Florida ran his course, uh, I believe he went to the Bucks. Right, uh, was his first, and he he was assistant coach, and then he was in the front office. And he was a uh, director of uh, player personnel there for quite some time. Then he went to Charlotte, I know after that. But the other thing that he did besides uh, being a coach and uh, being in the front office as an executive was he ran the NBA um, pre-draft camp in right. Chicago for many years. And I actually worked that camp for him. And just like you know what I remembered in college, he, he would make the coaches that were gonna run the camp come like two days early, we had, you know, day long meetings, both days. And I mean, that thing ran, you know, like a clock by the time. Uh, and he gave he gave all us young coaches. These were, were younger assistant coaches in the league that would volunteer for these things. And he gave us a lot of say in what we did and take ownership of it. So, I mean, he was just a master organization guy. And uh, he did that for many years for the league. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the last time I talked to him was when Juwan Johnson in 2010 or 2011 was thinking about uh, going pro early and uh, it was my last conversation with him. But your role as an assistant coach and, and, and role in the NBA, uh, you know, how, I guess maybe in my last question, just your takeaways, your influence, I mean, organization, 
uh, those types of things. There was nobody better than him. But uh, when you look at that, the life of Lee Rose and what it meant to the life of Jerry Seasting, uh, how do you put that into words? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been in the NBA, I don't think, without Coach Rose. And I know, you know, not just myself, but, I mean, he made Joe Barry Carroll a, yeah. a pro. I mean, Joe Barry was on track. To, uh, he was going to get a shot in the NBA, there's no question. But he, he was not going to be the number one pick if Lee Rose hadn't come there those last two years. And, you know, he, he, he got me on track, too. You know, I mean, he, he really came in, made everybody work, held everybody accountable you know, every player and, and, you know, we had the discipline. And like I said before, we had the uh, conditioning that we didn't have prior. And, uh, you know, he, he meant, he meant a lot to me. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you meant a lot to him. I know that because I can remember even my last conversations with him, he, he always one of his uh, favorites. Why? Because you did exactly what, what he needed. You were accountable. You made plays, you defended, and you led. And uh, that uh, was a very, very important thing for a very Great time in Purdue basketball, even though, yeah. even if that transition, yeah, Lee Rose beget Gene Katie and that worked out fine, but yeah, very strange situation and uh, one that uh, I don't think any of us know exactly what uh, all transpired there. But uh, uh, again, Lee Rose still had a great basketball life, a great life with his family, uh, an intense family man uh, as well. I think he's modeled uh, model all of us uh, well from that standpoint, too, because uh, that meant to him. Go ahead, Jerry. Right. One, one last thing. He wrote like three very in-depth books. Oh, yeah. I, I have them. They're excellent. Yeah. And, and anybody out there that's a, a coach or wannabe coach or just wants to learn some of the final, uh, finer nuances of the game, I mean, I, I would suggest, you know, looking that up, Lee Rose, he, he, I can't even think of the names. My books are in a box right now, so I don't, <laughs> I don't have them out. I, I would have them here and show them to you. But they, they were all very good books, and I know he spent a couple years on each one of them. Yeah, CoachLeeRose.com, I believe, is still the website, and you can get those books. And they are – he sent them to me over the years, and uh, they are they are detailed. If you, if you want to know how to run practice from soup to nuts – uh, and what to do, uh, it's all there for you. And that's a, a great legacy from that standpoint. And Joe Barry Carroll wrote a book. Wrote the book, yeah. 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 And so, I was so glad that they were able to get that done. As deep leaves suffered from, uh, from some Alzheimer's symptoms in his last years, but they were able to get that book done. It was a race to get it done, but that book is also available. And a very interesting read, uh, in my view. We, we, I think, promoted it back a couple of years ago, right when the pandemic started. Right. Uh, if you're a Purdue basketball fan, but also just a basketball fan of how, how people make decisions and do things and live a life, uh, that book documents it very well. Uh, and Joe Barry Carroll, I know, was one of his prouder things to be able to do that. So, Jerry, thanks for sharing your memories. I know it's going to have a difficult time because it's this person meant a lot to a lot of people in the basketball world. And uh, obviously your career speaks for itself, but uh, we all are, you know, we, it's important to, to recognize the people that helped get us there. And uh, you did a great job doing that. Right, so right, thanks right. so much. And we want to thank our sponsors also. This is our last show of the year with Triple X and Hilton Garden in State Farm agent Trent Johnson and the good folks at WLFI uh, for helping us uh, for another year of Gold and Black Live. We're going to be back next year, next season. Purdue opens football on Labor Day weekend. So I will probably have a show right before that uh, as well. So Jerry, thanks again. What a privilege uh, to share those memories with you. And uh, thanks to all of you for watching. And we'll look forward to 2022-23 year as well. Have a great uh, summer, everybody. All right. Thank you, Alan.